Humanities Lab from FGV School of Social Sciences, Sepedoki, and the Columbia Global Center in Rio de Janeiro. Professor Matthew Connolly will be presenting. He's an international global history professor at Columbia University in New York. He holds a PhD in history from Yale University. And at Columbia, he coordinates the History Lab, whose mission is to apply data science to social research. Professor Connolly has been a long-term collaborator with FGV and has worked with our history uh, repository, the archives. We would like to also take the opportunity to announce that our journal, Estudos Históricos, elected the best academic journal in the field of history and the fourth best journal in the field of history in the world is currently open to submissions until August 1st. The theme of the next issue will be Digital Humanities. Okay, so with that. Thank you so much. Um, and let me just first apologize for being late. Um, this is a brand new talk. I've never presented this before. And I'm a little bit, uh, you know, last minute, I'm always fussing and making little changes, and sometimes I take it too far. So I'm sorry I kept you waiting. But, um, but to me, it's exciting because I've been coming to FTV for about five years now. Um, I have now, you know, the great pleasure and honor of having longtime collaborators, uh, Celso Castro, uh, Renato Souza, Flavio Guelo, uh, Suami Higuchi, and so I'm, I'm really delighted, again, to be among Ernest Marcella, so good to see you. I'll respond to your email soon enough. Uh, <laughs> so good to see um, you know, many of you who I've collaborated with in the past, and even more exciting for me because I'm presenting you some, at least by the end, I'll show you some very new work. Uh, some of it published very recently, I'll talk about that too, but some of which um, I've not presented before, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to hearing your thoughts. Um, so let me just um, begin um, by talking to you about what it is I mean when I, I talk about predicting history, right? I mean, that could mean many things. Some of it sounds like science fiction. Um, by the end, I think maybe you too will think that some of what historians could be doing sounds a little like science fiction. Um, but I want to be very clear at the outset that some of what we're doing is really old-fashioned history. Um, and in fact, when we talk about you know, the history of historical scholarship, that is a very traditional kind of subject for scholars, right? Because scholars are, above all, interested in themselves. <laughs> they want to understand you know, why they and others you know, tend to work on certain subjects, certain questions, um, and they want to know how that changes over time. And even historians, in a way, we become like futurologists when we have to choose our dissertation subjects, or when we choose what books we want to write. Because it takes us so long. It takes us five, 10, sometimes 15 or 20 years before we're finished. And so we have to be thinking, you know, 20 years out, what is it that other scholars are still gonna be interested in? Um, and sometimes we even think about whether other people besides other historians might be interested in what we do. So this is the kind of thing that historians have been thinking about, and not just historians, you know, in other social science disciplines, people often think about you know, what sort of trends you can find in scholarship. But what I'm trying to do is, is look at this um, in a way where it's not just about reading this or that work by some great scholar and trying to uh, decide whether it's going to have influence and how it is the field is gonna change. What I'm gonna be looking at is looking at the past, but I'm gonna be looking at that history of history at scale. I'll be looking at thousands of articles that have been published over decades to see whether we can find certain trends you know, in, in what it is that historians, and I'll be talking, by the way, of historians of American foreign relations, at least in this field, the history of American diplomatic history, whether we can find patterns that might continue into the future. Um, now, in doing that, I'm gonna show you why it is that I see some really troubling worrisome trends. Uh, there is a pattern in how scholars have written about the history of American foreign relations. And the pattern is basically that as soon as the United States government decides to declassify some once secret records, as soon as those records become available to historians, very quickly they choose to write about 
those materials, right? They want to know about that history and they want to learn about it as soon as the government allows us to know. Um, and so right now, you know, there are historians who are very interested in writing about the history of the 1980s. The history of Ronald Reagan, Iran-Contra, right? The intervention in Nicaragua, and many other subjects that some of you maybe even remember, right? But it was 30, 40 years ago. But it's only now that those records are starting to become available, and that's what most diplomatic historians want to do. In a way, it's a little like they're journalists working with leaked records 30 or 40 years later. Um, now, when I was in graduate school, we were all working on the 1950s and 60s. And what we're going to see is how, over time, you, know, you see that trend continuing. How it is that when historians look at the past, what it is they tend to focus on is what history has finally become declassified. Now, the reason why that's becoming a problem is because less and less and less of the historical record is being declassified. The United States government is creating more secrets every day, not just the absolute number of secrets, but relative you know, to the past. There's more secrets now being produced every day than there ever were before. And fewer and fewer and fewer of those secrets are being released for researchers, or journalists, or the public. And in fact, the US government has just recently decided, the State Department, the Pentagon, that they are going to begin using machine learning algorithms to decide, of all the secret information that they're keeping away from us, what it is that we're going to be allowed to see 30, 40 years from now. Overwhelmed by the amount of secret information, they're beginning to use artificial intelligence, to use machine learning algorithms to decide what part of that official record is going to be preserved and what part of it is going to be deleted. So if you're an historian and you think, you know, I'm not really sure I'm that interested in artificial intelligence and machine learning, I have news for you. you know, what it is that you're going to be able to study as an historian going forward is going to depend very much you know, on what it is the government is trying to do right now using machine learning algorithms to decide what part of the historical record will be preserved and what part will be lost forever. So this is a kind of problem you can study. And the second part of the talk, I'm going to be discussing a, a new um, article that I just published with collaborators at Microsoft, um, where we tried to see whether it's possible to train algorithms to predict what it is that historians will one day think is important. Um, so I'll be running that kind of experiment, and you're going to see what kind of results we got. The short answer is, it's not possible. <laughs> it may not surprise you, but sadly, it's apparently a surprise you know, to the State Department and the Pentagon that what they're planning to do has been tried. We tried it. We spent years working on this, and we found that it's all but impossible to predict what historians will one day be interested in doing. Um, now, on the other hand, there are things that you can do with machine learning that really are quite worthwhile and, in fact, are going to become increasingly essential to deal with the challenge of big data. And when I've spoken in the past here at uh, Fundacio Getulio Vargas, I presented research that I've done with some of the data scientists here, uh, like Renato Souza and, and Flavio Coelho, where we talked about experiments that we were doing to review large numbers of official records, secret records, to see whether we could find more efficient, more effective ways of releasing those materials without releasing sensitive information, like private information, for instance. And in fact, the results are quite promising. And just yesterday, there was uh, someone from the Brazilian Foreign Ministry who is quite interested, at least in the potential for using methods like this, because, of course, it's not just the United States. It's many governments now that are dealing with the problem of big data and big classified data, and trying to see whether there might be methods to deal with all that. But I'm going to be talking about some other things today, some new things. Um, and one of the, the newest things that I've worked on is to see whether you can train algorithms to work like artificial archivists. To see whether you can train algorithms to go through large data sets of millions of historical records and identify the ones that historians are likely to find important. Um, now, that begs the question, 
And historians agree on what's important, right? I mean, what do we expect an algorithm to do? You know, do we expect algorithms to be able to predict what historians will say is important if we can't predict ourselves what other historians will consider important? So we ran the experiment to see whether historians, when you set them up in an experiment, to see whether they can agree with one another about what kind of history is important. We wanted to see whether they can agree with each other. And then we want to see whether, are they more likely to agree with each other, or are they more likely to agree with, with a machine learning algorithm? Um, so the results for me were quite shocking. <laughs> so if you stick around to the end, I hope you know, I'll be able to tell you about that, and you can tell me whether you think it's shocking. Maybe to you it won't be so interesting. Um, all right, so um, this is the first part. Um, I was interested in these questions, and I've been interested for a long time. Because again, like other scholars, I want to know, you know, what are other historians in my field working on? Can you detect patterns over time in terms of the kinds of things they focus on and things that they neglect? Um, how does that focus change over time? For instance, you know, there's a term among historians, presentism. Um, that's the idea that historians might be especially interested in things about the past that help us understand the present. Right? Sometimes that's a good thing, right? Because we want history um, to be usable. So people talk about a usable past. But sometimes it can be quite pernicious, right? Because if we impose our own you know, ideas of the world on the past, it can have a distorting effect. It can lead us to lose sight of things and misunderstand the past. Um, now finally, um, I wanted to see whether this is the kind of thing that can change over time and whether we can track these kinds of trends over time, and whether we might see whether these trends will continue into the future. So these are the sort of questions that I took on. And in order to do that, um, I started working with a group of students at Columbia. Um, these were two undergraduates and a master's student. Um, so this was a kind of, you know, uh, I don't know if you call it an experiment. We'll talk about what we mean by experiments in a little while. But it's the kind of thing that you can do without necessarily having a lot of training in data science. So this is largely a work that involved counting, right? And gathering data, and then trying to visualize that data um, to see what we could find. Now, to do that kind of experiment, uh, we had to figure out, like, what do we understand by the historical record? How do we represent the past, right? Because um, the past can be anything. Historians, they work with declassified documents. Uh, they do interviews. Um, sometimes they work with archaeologists. You know, sometimes they work with uh, material culture, right? Like something like this, 500 years ago, um, was unheard of. 500 years from now, they'll try to figure out what this was for. So historians do this kind of work all the time, like using everything we can to try to understand the past. But just for the sake of this exercise, we decided to use uh, a collection called Foreign Relations of the United States. This represents the official record of American foreign relations. And by act of Congress, it's been published every year since the American Civil War, since 1861. So for more than 150 years, the State Department has had the legal responsibility of producing bound collections of declassified documents that represent the official record of American foreign relations. And by law, you know, they are expected to produce a history that is fair and accurate and does not cover up you know, the crimes of the past. And so in these first volumes, you will find many crimes, right? There are many declassified documents from CIA operations. Um, you know, there are all kinds of documents about you know, militarism in the American government. Um, so to their credit, you know, these State Department historians, all of them trained as historians, all of them with PhDs, really do try to present you know, a record of American foreign relations. And when they fail, and they do sometimes fail, when, for instance, they're not allowed you know, to release records about, say, the overthrow of the Arbenz government in Guatemala, the overthrow of the Mossadegh government in Iran in 1953, it creates huge controversy. And newspaper stories are written about it, congressional hearings are held. And so over time, you know, this record, it's now over 220,000 documents and more than 500 volumes. The Foreign Relations of the United States is a reasonable approximation of the kind of historical record that historians would look to. It is a selection, right? And we'll talk in a moment of how it is that there, for every first document, there's a thousand or more other records that are not included. 
But these are meant to be the most important or at least representative documents from the history of American foreign relations. Now, to represent scholarship, that could, again, be many things, right? Because scholars, they give talks like this one, they uh, publish articles, they publish books, etc. So what we chose was the leading journal of the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations, or Schaefer. So this is the organization of about a thousand scholars who work on the history of American foreign relations. And so we took all of these issues of diplomatic history, um, we got permission <laughs> from the, the publisher from Oxford University Press, and we gathered up all of this as data, and we started to comb through uh, the citations. Right? And out of those, it's about uh, 2,000 or so articles. Um, there are more than 500, or more than a quarter, and this includes book reviews. <coughs> More than a quarter of these articles included some citation of the foreign relations of the United States. And if you added it up, you know, it wasn't quite 10%, but it was a fair number of all the citations in this journal came from this one source. So this is you know, just one of many different sources, but it is still the kind of uh, source that more historians use more often than any other. So for us, it was a reasonable way to represent what, is this, what it is that historians tend to, to interest themselves in. There were a few um, you know, limitations of this. You know, we don't have a historical journal going back to 1861. That's when Proust started. Diplomatic history only started in 77. So I'm only gonna be talking about the scholarship published you know, since 1977, so for the last 40 years or so. Um, and then also, you know, we were having to, to get this data from <coughs> pictures of articles. That means you have to run optical character recognition to get text. You know, from these pictures of, of documents, uh, of articles in this case. And then finally, you know, as you can imagine, like historians are not always consistent, like we can cite the same source in different ways, um, and we couldn't catch every citation. We think there are actually more citations than we were able to find. Um, and so for us, the safest thing was to count the unit of, of analysis here, the unit of measurement, is whether a volume of the foreign relations of the United States was published in one article. There might have been multiple citations of the same volume. And so we're not differentiating between whether a single volume was published and cited 15 times or one time in the same article. But we can count whether it's cited in 15 articles versus one article. All right, so those are some of the limitations. Now, we do think it's valid you know, to use that as a unit of measurement. And we do think, again, that diplomatic history is a reasonable way of representing scholarship. And we think that foreign relations the United States is a a reasonable way of representing the historical record. And you do find, you know, uh, it varies, right, from year to year. Um, but more or less, you know, historians have been consistently using this source over time. So we think we can use it to characterize scholarship of American foreign relations over the 40 or so years since uh, diplomatic history was published. Now here's what we find. Um, now this is a, a heat map, right? So the more, you know, citations of, uh, foreign relations in the United States in an article you know, published in a particular five-year period, the more citations there are, the brighter the heat map, right? The fewer citations, like if there were no citations, right, in the period, you know, roughly 2000, 2005, actually it's like 1998 to 2003, um, from the, um, the volumes that were published in the 1940s, you see that's very dark, right, because there are no citations. And obviously, for the period of history where, you know, this is again showing um, the year that the foreign relations the United States volumes were being published along the x-axis. And this is showing you the years that the articles were getting published in the Diplomatic History Journal. Now, obviously, nobody is citing anything that hasn't been published yet. <laughs> so unless we we're actually in the future, you know, this should be very dark as it is, right? Because there are no citations in the future. Now, what I think you can see, you know, even from just counting, right, and representing the data this way, is that it's pretty clear that what historians were publishing on when diplomatic history began um, were the volumes of the foreign relations of the United States that were being published in that same period of the mid to late, late 1970s. And in the following decade, in the 1980s, scholars writing about the history of American foreign relations they tended to be writing about um, the uh, same history. And sometimes, you know, a little bit later, they'd also be writing about volumes that were published in 1980. 
And over time, we see this persist, right? We see how it is that over time, historians, when in the early 2000s, when they're looking back, deciding what kind of history to write about, they tend to be writing about the documents that have just been declassified. Um, now in a moment, I'm gonna talk about that and what we should make of that. But just to get into it a little bit more, if you took you know, all of the citations of all of the years from the official record of American foreign relations in the leading journal of American diplomatic history, what you find is that there's a clear pattern where uh, it's about 10 years or so after a given document is declassified that you find the maximum number of citations. And then it rapidly falls off until you have almost no citations. And why is it about 10 years? Well, in a way, it makes sense because you know a historian may, in graduate school, decide what dissertation they want to write. You know, they begin to do research on that subject. They start to look in the archives to see what's available. And it takes them years, right? Typically, it's six or seven years before a dissertation is done. And then, in most cases, it takes another three years or so um, before they begin to publish articles from it and before they begin to publish books from it. So it's about 10 years. So there's this kind of wave you know, that's moving forward over time. This is also true if you begin to break it down. So we took you know, 10 years of scholarship from diplomatic history, 77 to 87, and then the next 10 years, um, 88 to 97, and then 98 to 2007, and then 2008 um, to 2017. And we wanted to see whether you find the same pattern. And in fact, you do. Uh, you find that this trend, or not, not even a trend, this is a pattern now, right? It's not really changing. It's a pattern where historians tend to cite the most recently declassified documents, and then they ignore everything else. Now, is there a problem with this? Um, let me just show you one last image, and then we'll talk about why we should care about this, and whether it matters. Um, now, in this case, instead of showing you the year that that Foreign Relations United States volume was published, I'm showing you the year, uh, the years that that volume represented in terms of the official record. So those volumes that were getting published in the late 1970s um, were volumes that were about the early Cold War and World War II. So these were volumes about the 1940s. And these were the ones that historians are writing about in the 1970s. Now when it got to be the 1980s, historians started to write more about the early 1950s. When it got to be the 1990s, they started to write more about the uh, late 50s and 1960s, and so on, until you get to the last 10 years or so. And now everybody's interested in the 1960s and the early 1970s. So in effect, historians are just writing history based on government handouts. What it is the government is going to allow us to know is exactly what it is we think we should know. And apparently, everything that's come before has no relevance to the present. These are like the dark ages, <laughs> as far as like, contemporary diplomatic history is concerned. Um, and if you look at the most cited volumes of all, they're almost all from the same period. Right? Um, they're almost all from the late 1940s, early 1950s. And every single one of the top 10 most cited volumes from the official record of American foreign relations are about Europe. right? Europe, it's like it's the center of the world as far as the world of diplomatic historians are concerned. The only volume that's not about um, Europe is about East Asia and the Pacific. Um, and why is that? Well, it's probably because um, this is the volume <clears throat> that's about the Korean War, um, 1950. But otherwise, you see every single volume that's been cited more than any other. The, the part of the official record that American diplomatic historians really care about, it's about the early Cold War in Europe. And much of the rest of the history of the world is, it's as if like here be dragons. You know like those old maps of the world, the parts of the world that had not yet been discovered? It's a little bit like that. A large part of the historical record has never been cited by any historian, at least in this particular journal, which again is the leading journal in the field. Um, as you can see, the vast majority, the most common you know, number for the number of times any given volume has been cited is zero, right? There's more than 80 volumes out of the, uh, I think, 400 or 500 now, that have never been cited even once. Um, so when you get closer to the present, for those volumes that are published between 1956 and 1990, 150 volumes, 
Every single one of them has been cited at least once. So historians are keenly interested, again, in reporting what has just been declassified, and that's the history they tend to write about. So they're not presentists, <laughs> because if you're really a presentist, if you're really interested in history because of what it can tell you about the present, then you'd move around over time, right? You wouldn't just be writing about the most recently declassified records. What it is the government is allowing you to know here and now? You'd be interested in knowing about the rest of the history of Americans' engagement in the world. You're interested in the history of America's engagement with Central and South America. You'd be interested in 1898, right? You'd be interested in the Monroe Doctrine. I mean, some of these concepts, right, are almost timeless, but their importance, their relevance changes over time. And you would expect historians to pay attention to that, but they're not, right? So this is, for me, one of the real problems when you look at the field of uh, history of American foreign relations. Now, this is the other problem. You remember how I was talking about the most cited volumes, how they're all from the late 1940s? Well, I was not holding constant you know, the number of uh, documents that were available to cite. Because if you look at all the documents published in the foreign relations of the United States, um, and this is just going back for now, these are just the ones that have been digitized and put online. It goes back to 1932. And if you look at the number <coughs> of documents that have been declassified in terms of the date that those documents were originally written, 1945 is the peak year. Ever since then, the number of documents that have been declassified and made available to researchers has been going down and down and down and down. So if the historians who write about the history of American foreign relations are living off of government handouts, right, and everything, you know, generally, that, it is, that we interest ourselves in when writing about the past depends on what it is the government allows us to know, we're fighting over scraps, right? <coughs> So there's less and less of the official record even available to us, even if we keep insisting on writing about the tiny part of it they'll let us have. Now, this is something that shows you how it is that the number of records over time has been going up and up and up. And we shouldn't be surprised by this. Like if you go back to 1945, the United States had fewer than 50 embassies in the world. You know, we now have almost 200, right? We now have hundreds and hundreds of different international organizations. There are thousands and thousands of treaties, right? There are non-governmental organizations. The growth of NGOs has gone up exponentially. You know, the field of international history um, has grown by leaps and bounds. You know, the complexity of, of global politics is, is far and away, like, more complex than it ever was. And the record of American foreign relations, when it's first created, reflects that. Because when you track um, the diplomatic cables, this, for now, ignore that, but this is just showing you the number of diplomatic cables that have been withdrawn, ones we're not allowed to see. This is showing you, um, if nothing else, how it is that the number of cables has gone up and up and up. But what this graph is really about is showing you how it is that more and more of those cables um, have not been released. More and more of them are being withheld from researchers. And this is especially true you know, of the most secret, the most sensitive cables. So it's gotten to the point where even 40-year-old diplomatic cables you know, from the 1970s are being withheld at an astonishing rate. A lot of these cables were never classified to begin with, though. And they're being withheld apparently because they, they have personally identifiable information. Um, so this is a problem, right? If historians seem to only care about the most recent kind of history that we can know from declassified records, and they're not letting us have any more of these declassified records, you know, then what's, what's to become of history, history itself, at least the history that historians do? I'm not exaggerating. There's, over the last year and a half, there are virtually no more volumes of the foreign relations of the United States that have been published. The reason? The Pentagon has refused to clear any new releases of diplomatic documents through the foreign relations of the United States. Um, the Pentagon, the CIA, you know, the Treasury Department, Every major department agency concerned with American foreign relations has to agree to the publication of a new volume of these declassified documents. And the Pentagon has refused to allow any new volumes to be released in the last year and a half. Yeah, there's a question. Oh, sorry. Okay. All right. Now, this, there are political reasons for this, as we all know. 
Um, I could go on about that in the Q and A if you want to know why it is you know that these things are happening. The CIA has also dissolved the Historical Review Panel. Um, so you know when I talked about how State Department historians are trying to do their job, they're still trying to do their job, but the other parts of the government you know are preventing them from doing it. Um, and there are political reasons for that that I can discuss, but there are also very practical reasons. This is the amount of money uh, that the U.S. government was spending up until 2015 on official secrecy. There's a government office that tracks how much money is spent on keeping uh, government secrets. It's actually now over $20 billion. Uh, this is the Snowden effect. <laughs> so there's a big jump, right, after uh, Snowden blew the cover on the NSA. And then they began doing even more, like things in terms of security management, professional training, blah, 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 blah. But what they're not doing anymore of, in fact, what they're doing less and less of is declassification. Declassification is this tiny blue line. It was a little bit less tiny back in the late 1990s when the government was releasing over 200 million pages of declassified documents a year. Over the last 10 years or so, they released about 30 to 40 million. Um, so there are political reasons for this, but there's also this very practical reason, is that the government and Congress too just won't spend money on declassification. Um, and neither will they spend money on archiving, even maintaining the archives that we currently have. Um, so for example, I don't know if many of you, you know, are familiar with presidential libraries, but in the United States, ever since Franklin Roosevelt, um, every president, um, when they leave office, um, their papers are transferred to a library. Uh, it's often in their hometown, right, where they grew up. Um, and that library then, after about 30 or 40 years, becomes a site for researchers. Um, so where I'm from in New York, many people will get on a train and go up to Hyde Park, New York, which is the home of Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, he donated the land for the creation of the first presidential library. And that's where you would go to find the, the papers that are now declassified from the, uh, the Roosevelt administration. And there are libraries like this all over the country. So the, uh, the Eisenhower Library is in Abilene, Kansas. The Truman Library is, is in Missouri. And the Obama Library was supposed to be in Chicago. But there won't be any Obama Library. There won't be any Obama Library. This is going to be a museum. It's going to be a museum. There won't be any papers there. There won't be any presidential papers. They won't be declassified and made available to researchers. There is a new plan. Um, it was decided that presidential libraries are too expensive. And so from now on, all of the secret records from American administrations, going all the way back, all the way back to Roosevelt, the ones that have still not been released are going to be moved to Washington. They're going to put them in trucks, on convoys, and they're going to ship them back to Washington for, and centralize them. Um, and it will be the end of presidential libraries. The George W. Bush Library in Texas will be the last presidential library. This is just one example, and there are many, of how it is, you know, the way in which we preserve the historical record in the United States over the last 60 or 70 years is completely changing. For example, if you wanted to get those papers from those presidencies, like you wanted to know about the history of the Iraq War, for instance, it used to be that after a few decades, uh, this is happening right now with the Clinton administration, they are, or have been, systematically declassifying. What that means is they're going through those files, file by file, and reviewing them and deciding what can be released to researchers and what they have to still keep secret. That's over. They're no longer doing systematic declassification. The only way that you can get any one secret documents out of a presidential, um, uh, a set of presidential papers is by filing a Freedom of Information Act request. And if you know what the so-called FOIA um, program is like in the United States, you know that you will be waiting years before you get anything. And what you do get may be completely redacted, right? Um, for historians, uh, if we don't have any way of knowing what's in an archive, we don't know where to begin. And unfortunately, that's the future that faces us. Um, more and more um, government records are electronic records. They're not papers filed in files and files gone, going into filing cabinets. More and more, they're databases. And so archivists at the National Archives are now saying there will no longer be any finding aids. Right? Like the ones that you are still create here at CP. Um, instead, all you're going to have uh, is a database and you're going to have a search engine. And good luck to you. Right? You're going to have to try to find stuff using a search engine. 
And then this is the, the thing I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, they're also using data science to decide what it is they're going to preserve. Because they've decided there's just too much data, too much secret information, and they're not going to be able to preserve all of it. This is not something entirely new. In fact, you know, forever, going all the way back, you know, at least uh, in the United States, it goes back to the 1930s. Archivists have long gone through the official record and selected those records that will be preserved. And it's estimated that over time, they preserve about 3% of all the records that government officials produce. But what's changed now is that instead of archivists going through files, right, 20, 30 years after the fact, and deciding what of those, of those materials that's still important and has to be preserved, they're not going to have archivists doing this kind of work. They're going to have government officials deciding right now what records they're creating that future historians and journalists and citizens should be allowed to have. And then based on that training data, and I'll talk in a moment about how these things are supposed to work, that training data is then going to be used to train algorithms who are going to start automatically deleting records that they decide are not worth saving. So even if you're an historian or a humanist or a social scientist and you're not interested in data science, data science is interested in you. <laughs> it's interested in, in whether it is, you know, the records that you may or may not be allowed to consult are going to be saved or whether they're going to be deleted forever. So this is changing the whole way in which historians are going to be able to access the past. And one last thing, if you're not an historian and you only have a passing interest in history, think of it this way. There's so much that was done during the Obama administration, right? Like uh, drone strikes, right? I mean, Obama legalized uh, this innovation under the Bush administration where an American president could decide at any moment that any one of you, or even me for that matter, should die because we're designated as an enemy combatant. That would seem like a radical idea you know, when uh, it was one developed by the Bush administration. But the Obama administration decided that they had the legal authority to do that. And they got Justice Department lawyers to agree with them. Wouldn't you like to know how it is they get to decide who lives and who dies? Well, there's so much history that's relevant for all of us, right? Sometimes these are life and death questions. And the way these questions have been decided are things now that we're going to know or not know. Not now, because they won't let us. These things are still secret. We're only going to be able to find out at some date in the long away future, right? When some part of that record is open to us or not. Right? So if they're not accountable to historians, if they don't answer to us, then who do they answer to? So that's why I think this is much bigger than history. This is really about democracy, right? Such as it is, right? And whether we can keep it. All right, so I have been going too slow. So I'm gonna to try to move a little more quickly. Um, this part of what I'm gonna be presenting to you um, is something that was published in Nature Human Behavior. And I'm happy to share this presentation with Suemi uh, or anyone else. And Suemi, you could perhaps make it available if people wanna have a look at these slides. So um, trust me, you, you can take pictures if you want, but um, you'll be able to have the slides as well if you're interested. And the ones I'm about to show you, not this particular one, but I'll share all the slides, but the, this graph is not from the paper itself. Um, but the paper itself is available in Nature Human Behavior. It was just published. And that too, if you don't have access to it, I'm happy to make that available to Swami. You can share it with anyone who wants to see it. But even before um, my colleagues and I at Columbia had heard how it is the government are using algorithms to decide what part of history to preserve, we were interested in seeing whether that was possible. We wanted to see whether it was possible for people to predict um, what part of what's happening right now will one day be deemed historically important. Um, this is now a very practical question, but it started out as a philosophical question. And you can go back to Hegel, right? Hegel um, once wrote how the owl of Minerva spreads its wings only with the falling of the dusk, right? Minerva representing wisdom, right? Um, and the owl, you know, many of us as historians, we think that this owl, in fact, is speaking to us. <laughs> because we think, like Hegel, that you can't really know what part of what's happening now will one day be deemed to be historic um, until it's over. Right? Like the Trump presidency. Many of us think we have already know more than we need to or want to, right, about this administration. There are many historians already who have said he's the worst president in history. And I think they're right. 
But as historians, you know, we know that good history requires some distance, right? You need a little time to reflect. Um, so um, that's why you know many historians and philosophers too think that you can't really know what it is about the present that's important and what we should think about it until it's over, right? Until the historical era is over and we have some distance from it. Um, now, this is also the judgment of most historians. So I did a survey recently. It was not a huge survey, but I asked all of the members of this organization I told you about, the thousand plus members of the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations. I asked them, you know, how easily do you think government officials can identify which of their records future historians will likely find more or less interesting? And I asked them to do it like on a scale of one to 10. And as you can see, um, they were extremely skeptical. The most common answer um, you know, was four, you know, which is kind of unlikely. Right? And there were some of them who thought it was impossible, right? as you can see. So this is something that most historians are quite skeptical about. Um, so how do you study such a thing? Um, so to design the perfect experiment, you would need about 30 years. <laughs> because you would need, first of all, like to somehow have a census some record of everything happening in the world right now, right? Somebody just came in the room. Somebody's gonna leave the room. Is one of these things historic? I mean, perhaps, right? If they took a gun out, then we'd be making this history. Hopefully they won't. But you'd have to have a census, a record of everything happening at any given time. Most of these things are not gonna be very important. And we're gonna forget about it soon enough. Even that joke, it was a bad joke. You're gonna forget it and be happy when you do it. So most of what's happening is not important. But some things, you know, are important. How do we know what's important and what is important? How do we even begin to represent what people at the time think is important? And then, imagine 30 years later, you'd have to look back at this record, this census of events, right? More or less important. And then you'd have to agree on of those many things, millions of things that were happening, which of those things turned out to actually matter? So that is a really hard experiment to run. And by definition, it would take a good 30 years. So because we didn't have 30 years, um, what we did was, was something not as good, right? But what we still think might be valid. So what we did was we took that same collection of historical documents. Um, and first, we took those documents that were produced by State Department officials when they started to create electronic records. And they started to create millions of them. These are the same cables that um, Julian Assange released when Chelsea Manning gave them to him, the WikiLeaks cables. We didn't use the WikiLeaks cables, but we used the same kinds of information, the same diplomatic cables from the 1970s, ones that have actually been declassified. One reason is that there are 10 times more of them. So we have a lot of data now, we have millions of these. And then what we did was we looked at um, how it is that the State Department officials who wrote those diplomatic cables, how they classified them, literally. Did they classify them as secret? But also, like, did they designate them as eyes only, right? Did they address them to the most senior officials? Did they uh, call them urgent or not urgent? Um, were they administrative in nature? Or were they about like political affairs and political negotiations? So we used all the metadata from these records and we developed a score um, to try to represent what it is that seemed the most important at the time and what it is that seemed very unimportant at the time. So what was unimportant, we thought, were the kinds of things that were not classified, that were not urgent, that didn't go to senior officials, that were administrative in nature. And so we used that score, and then we assigned that number um, to each and every one of those million or so cables that we were looking at. And then what we did was we, of all those cables, we found the ones that historians from the State Department had selected to include in the foreign relations of the United States. It was a tiny fraction. It was one-tenth of one percent of all of those cables were chosen by historians as representing the official record of American formulations. And then what we did was we tried to test this idea as to whether people at the time you know, would be able, through the perceived contemporary importance of PCI, whether that score uh, was correlated with whether a cable was actually chosen for inclusion in the foreign relations of the United States. And then we trained an algorithm to do the same thing. And we call this the ideal chronicler. Because there was another philosopher, um, Arthur Danto, who once said that, imagine you could create an ideal chronicler, 
And the chronicler would have all the information in the world. And they would have a way of amassing all that information and analyzing it at lightning speed. And even though he wasn't familiar with machine learning, this was decades ago, in effect, you know, what we think of as machine learning is a little bit like that. You know, machine learning algorithms can take a lot of data, right, more than a million diplomatic cables, and they could use uh, supercomputers, right, and high-performing algorithms um, to use that knowledge to optimize their ability to predict whether a cable, in this case, is going to be included in the foreign relations of the United States or not. So in tribute to Arthur Danto, we call this the simulated ideal problem. And we pitted these two against each other. So we wanted to see whether people at the time, you know, how good they were at predicting what would be historic and whether the algorithm could do better. Um, and we trained you know, the ideal chronicler with those half a million cables, including the ones that have been uh, in formulation in the United States. And then we wanted to test its ability out of sample to find the other 621 cables, right? Among the 700,000 um, in the haystack, right? So in English, we talk about the needle in the haystack. Do you have this in Portuguese as well? Yeah, we do by you. Okay, so, so the idea is like the haystack's really big. There's a lot of stuff that looks like needles. And so it's a hard task you know, to pull out the, the needle from that haystack. Um, now the way you evaluate how well you perform is by First of all, seeing how many of those um, that you um, wanted to find, that is, the ones that were identified as historic, how many did you actually find? And of the ones that your algorithm predicted would be historic, how many of them were not historic, were not chosen for foreign relations in the United States? So the other way to look at it is, you know, of the ones that you didn't think were historic, how many of them were not in foreign relations in the United States? And vice versa. How many of those that actually were historic, historic um, were not identified by your algorithm? And then what you do is you choose a trade-off that gives you the best performance between these two things. We call them recall and precision. Um, and what this shows in a nutshell is basically that even if you are a dart-throwing monkey, it's another expression we have in English, even if it's completely random, you will be right some of the time. Now the perceived contemporary importance score that is representing what people thought was going to be historic is better than random. So it's better than a dart throwing monkey. But not by much. Especially as you throw in more and more and more of hay onto the haystack. So if you took like, let's say 100 cables that are historic and 100 cables that weren't, um, people at the time, even you know, dart throwing monkeys, if they guess that everything you know, is going to be historic, they're going to be right half the time. And people at the time are even better than that. But if instead you have 50 you know, strands of hay for every needle, or 100, or over 1,000, the performance gets worse and worse and worse. And this, this is the world we live in, right? Because for every historic event, you know, for every war, for every like war that's averted, you know, there are thousands and thousands of other things that happen that are much less significant, right? So in effect. You know, we find that whether it's random, you know, whether it's people guessing at the time, or even with the benefit, you know, of big data, right, and super and high performance computing, people are very poor at identifying what will one day be historic, or even in this case, like using an ideal chronicler, doing this automatically. Um, now, remember I talked about what the trade-off is. So data scientists, when they evaluate performance, they look at the F1 score. So you want to look at the best F1 score. And that is a combination of recall, right? Recall meaning like if it's 0.25, that means you got 0.25, 25% of the cables that were historic. You actually managed to capture them. And then precision, uh, 0.25 means that um, of the ones that you found, how many of them you know, were not actually uh, historic cables? How much hay do you have instead of needles? Now, data scientists are interested in optimizing you know, to get the best F1 score. But imagine you had a different question. So what this is representing is what I was just talking about, how it is that you have a certain number of true positives, right? That's the recall. Of all the ones that really were historic, how many ones did you capture? 
right? In the, the case of the perceived contemporary importance, the number of true positives was 17. But there are many, many more that it predicted would be historic. People at the time thought things were important that turned out not to be. So this is pretty poor performance. This is only marginally better. You know, the number of true positives is 27 instead of 17, but the number of false positives is lower, right? So marginally better, but there's still a significant difference. But what if, imagine, imagine if instead of you know, optimizing for this F1 score, um, if it, you had a different goal. Imagine you were an archivist. And the, what, the uh, Trump administration has just told you that you have to go through a million diplomatic cables that were written last year. And you have to choose which ones you think should be preserved for history and which ones should be deleted forever. You can't go through a million cables, right? Um, so you could, on the other hand, perhaps go through 40,000, right? You might be able to go through 40,000. So what this approach can do, if you have a different cutoff, if you change you know, your measurement, right, as to what it is you really care about, so that you optimize for precision, more than recall, you get rid of 80% of the hay. Um, actually, let me say that again. You get rid of, sorry, 94% of the hay, uh, and you still get 80% of the needles. So the same kind of approach, you know, with a different kind of trade-off, does allow you, you know, to manage your archive in a way um, where you still get most of what you think is likely to be historic. Um, while still making it manageable to go through them one by one. If all you have to go through is that, is that residual number. All right, so I know I'm, I'm moving pretty fast, but I will share with you the, uh, the article from Nature Human Behavior. So to wrap up, <laughs> these are the sorts of things that can be done right now and in fact are already being done. So many times if you go like to the CPDOC website, you want to look through the, um, uh, the records there, you can do filtered searching. Um, in effect, you're using data science because you know, the way these algorithms work really depend on data science research. And especially if some of those things that you're searching for may have been automatically extracted from those records. Um, so filtered searching is something we do all the time and we don't think much about it. But if you're doing that, you're already in effect doing digital history. There's much more that you could do without searching, right? And so if you're interested, um, I um, have a project at Columbia where um, if you look at, your, look at a website, you go to history-lab.org. Um, we've been experimenting with a number of new ways, different ways you can represent what you have in large historical archives when you don't know what you're looking for. Because many times that's the predicament we're in. We don't necessarily even know what keywords to search for or how to begin filtering to find the stuff we're interested in. So if you have a look, you'll find other tools for doing this kind of work. Um, and then there's distant reading, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment. Um, there are also many tools for archivists. Um, and that's, to me, like in some ways even more important. Because unless we can develop data science tools to help archivists do their job, then historians won't have anything to work with. All right, so distant reading, it's an idea that came from an uh, Italian uh, literary uh, critic named Franco Moretti. And his idea was, you know, whereas literary critics in the past, they would read one novel, or 10, or 100, it's now possible, in effect, to read so-called thousands of novels. You can read, in effect, the entire canon if you use data science tools to analyze very large corpora. And what you could do, for instance, is you can show, like, with the history of the British novel, you can show how, over time, there have been different genres, right? There's the Gothic novel, there's the historical novel, and none of them have gone away, right? They continue, but there are periods where they start to peak. But the relative size of that new genre when it comes along has shrunk over time. Because as more and more genres proliferate, um, even when you have a, a brand new one that people are excited about, there's still many others that, that persist, right? So this is the kind of thing you could not have even realized, and you might not have even asked the question um, if you didn't look you know, at many thousands of novels at the same time. So this is the kind of thing that historians do as well. And sometimes we do it in very crude ways. <laughs> but
but still very effectively. So for example, a colleague of mine, Sam Moyne, wrote a history of human rights. And he made a very radical argument about how nobody really talked about human rights, relatively speaking, until the late 1960s and 1970s. And to make that argument, he asked his research assistants, he wasn't going to do this, he had his research assistants painstakingly search the New York Times and the London Times for the term human rights, right? And he simply counted. So this kind of thing, there's validity in it. Like Google has created a tool, the Ngram Viewer, which does the same thing with the Google Books corpus. So instead of having to manually look things up every year, you can now look at a lot of books, you know, millions of them at the same time. And on the History Lab website, we have the same thing. Um, except instead of looking at books or looking at two newspapers, now you can look at big corporate declassified documents, like State Department records and Kissinger's telephone conversations. And you can measure and compare, like, how much did Henry Kissinger compare, uh, care about human rights compared to the rest of the State Department? The answer is very little. So you can begin to compare these things, and you can, you can do many more experiments like this. But to me, the most exciting thing of all, and this is where I'm going to end, <laughs> is to get at this question, you know, what is history? Like, what is it that we care about as historians? And to begin with, just taking that, you know, not as the kind of philosophical question that's usually treated as, but to take it as a very practical question. If you're going to have machine learning algorithms predicting what part of the historical record scholars will one day be interested in, you need to know whether scholars themselves can agree with one another. And so we ran this experiment. Uh, my colleagues at Microsoft and I, after we were finished um, testing the ideal quantum, um, and we saw how well or how badly it performed, we asked ourselves, you know, is it possible that some of the documents that the State Department historians chose as historically significant might not have been the most significant documents from the point of view of other historians? Like, is it really a fair test, right? I mean, maybe we should see whether historians themselves can agree, and whether they might actually agree more with the algorithm than they do with the State Department. And so what we did was, uh, we didn't pick them at random. Um, the same organization that had a historical documentation committee, we asked six of them to evaluate 75 of these diplomatic tables. Uh, 25 of them were ones where both the State Department historians and the algorithm agreed were part of that official record and should be. 25 were ones that the algorithm was most confident would be published in the foreign relations United States, but weren't, and then vice versa. And we wanted to see what happened. So what do you think happened? I'm gonna show you the results in a moment. Um, but let me, let me just see if, um, yeah, I wanna see, let's see, future directions. I wanna see if, uh, and I may not even be able to show you, but I wanna see like, what do you think would happen? Do you think historians are more likely to agree with the State Department historians? Are they more likely to agree with the algorithm? Or are they more likely to agree with one another? Okay, how many people think they're more likely to agree with one another? Show of hands. Most people are gonna abstain, I think, okay. Show of hands, all right. How many people think that they're more likely to agree with the State Department historian? Okay, more people. How many think they're more likely to agree with the algorithm? machine learning algorithm. I think that's a smaller number. They are much more likely to agree with a machine learning algorithm <laughs> than they are to agree with either the State Department historian or with one another. Now, I know that sounds kind of crazy because like, what does the algorithm know about history? Like you think other historians would know more and they'd know enough to agree with one another? Well, the thing is, it was kind of a trick question because the way that algorithm was trained was based on the collective wisdom of 40 historians. There are 40 historians who work at the State Department putting out these foreign relations in the United States volume. That was the training data that trained the algorithm to recognize what looked like a historic record, right? So it's a little bit like if you ever go to Netflix, right? Or even better, if you have like a movie review out, um, aggregator, I don't know if you have Rotten Tomatoes here. In the US, we have something called Rotten Tomatoes. And I always go there when I want to decide what to go see. Because I know that I'm often going to disagree with what a movie critic says. Because, you know, movie critics, sometimes they have their own ideas, right? And they're very quirky and weird and whatever. And maybe they're just tired of science fiction, but I'm not. So I'm interested, like, if you looked at all the movie critics, you know, what do they tend to like, right? And I find that I tend to agree with the average score of all those movie critics. 
are more likely to agree with that collective wisdom, the wisdom of the crowd, as some people put it, than I am with the individual believer. So in effect, the algorithm is, is reproducing the collective knowledge you know, of those 40 historians. So an individual historian will pick a weird document that most historians will think is weird in the same way that a movie critic will pick a bad movie that most other movie critics will think is bad. But what you can begin to do with this machine learning algorithm is you can begin to replicate that kind of collective knowledge. Not to replace historians, but simply to assist them. All right, um, okay, and that's the rest of it, right? And we won't talk about that unless you really want to. So these are the sorts of things you know, that I think can be done, and we're starting to do these things at History Lab and here at uh, CPI, <coughs> and I'm excited about it. So I'm sorry if I went on for too long, but I am excited about it. So I'm interested in hearing your questions. Yeah. Thank you very much for such a wonderful presentation. You mentioned that you could go over a few of the 